grateful for this evening. Thank you for uh, these parents. Thank you for working in their hearts and uh, directing them to have their children here at CHA. Pray that you bless the remainder of this evening and allow it to be helpful and encouraging. Uh, Lord, it has been this evening, this presentation, uh, way back when my father did it for uh, 15 or more years, has been very encouraging and helpful to parents. So I pray that you do the same thing tonight uh, in the lives of these parents this evening. We thank you for your love for us, your goodness to us. Pray your blessings on uh, this school, our families, in particular our children. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, um, let me, um, before we get there, um, first of all, let's, let's think about your child. Um, so, get him or her in your mind, or hims or hers in your mind. Um, that's really, that's why you're here. Uh, you, you chose, or the Lord directed you to uh, enroll your child at CHA. So, that's why you're at this new parent meeting at CHA. So, I want to just ask you a couple of questions and then answer them. Why was your child created? Interesting question. We don't really think about that much. God did create your child. It's not just a biological fact, husband, wife. We know that, okay? God created us, all right? Why, though? Lots of good reasons, okay? Any thoughts on that? Or have you thought about that? (laughs) Were there too many diapers to even have that thought yet? (laughs) I, I, again, there's, there's lots of reasons, okay, but I believe that one of, if not the ultimate reason, is Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, I believe that's the answer. God created us for his glory. Uh, and if you've heard, I don't know, some, some of my favorites are John Piper, Al Mohler, um, uh, Tim Keller, uh, some of the guys that I read and listen to. Over and over and over and over again, they reiterate this fact that we were created for God's glory. Um, so, that being the case, how, how is your child going to grow from where he or she is today in his or her life and, and glorify the Lord? I'm not going to go into what that means. I, with the eighth graders, I, Mr. Henderson, Brady's uh, in that class. We talked about what does it mean to glorify God? We can't go over all that. Uh, but is it going to just happen? Are your kids just going to, ding, glorify God in their life? Probably not, right? Uh, it didn't happen like that in our lives. Uh, we, a lot of things God did in us. So what are some things um, that, that have to happen or have to be present in or Im- impressed upon your child's life so that he will one day live a life that glorifies God, as God created us to do so. Again, I'm I'm asking these questions intentionally, so we're getting there, okay? Um, Well, I I wrote down several, actually just a few. First of all, God's grace, okay? I was talking to Dawn Pruitt, so you know Dawn, my administrative assistant. Uh, I knew, well, she went to school here. Uh, She was one of my, actually, I did not have Dawn in class. She didn't ever take a math class in high school, so I didn't have Dawn. I knew her, though. I was a teacher here. And, uh, and I knew her husband, Tim, before they got married. Uh, so I just said, how did, tell me about how you and Tim. I, I don't know the story. And uh, so anyway, her background is incredible. It's just like, really? I said, how do you explain where you are today? And she just went, God's grace. She said, just God's grace. I said, yeah, that's right. That is, that is the answer, one of the answers. But God, in his grace, um, uh, biblical parenting is another thing that God uses. Some of us did not have biblical parenting in our homes. I understand that. God's grace overrides that, okay? It did in Dawn's life. But biblical parenting is one of the things that God intends to impress upon children, to train them so that they do grow to glorify Him. Involvement in a local church, as we heard this morning in our chapel service, I love my local church, was our theme for our chapel. Uh, the local church is very, very important. It's the body of Christ. Uh, involvement in that is, is critical. And then I wrote down education. Um, so, and that's why we're here, okay? So, so education. Um, let me, I, I looked, uh, the Barna Research Group, uh, in February of 05, did this report, parents describe how they raise their children. There's two interesting questions here. The one I want to show you is the, it says most desirable outcomes for kids. Um, so what, what that means is you're raising your child. What is the highest thing you want for your child? What's number one on your list? And uh, by far, in a way, I'll read it to you. Uh, by far, the top-rated outcome was getting a good education. 
four out of every 10 parents, 39%, listed that as a critical outcome that they were committed to facilitating. That was very interesting. Uh, on down the list, the last one on the list actually is uh, establish appropriate moral values. Something's wrong with that, okay? I want my kids to get a good education. Moral values, meh. Wait a second. I would rather my children be morally pure, okay, and, and not be able to read, okay, than have a good education and have immoral lives, okay? Um, no, I, I'm, not, I'm glad I don't have to make that choice, but they do need a good education. I agree with that, but I don't. The other one, by the way, is, is, is similarly interesting. Um, what makes a parent successful? Uh, I interviewed over 2,000 parents all over the country. And if you'd not read anything by George Barna, you would do well. A Revolutionary Parenting by George Barna is an excellent parenting book. Um, so uh, what makes a parent successful? What do you have to have in your life to be a successful parent? Okay? This isn't part of my presentation. It's just interesting to me. Um, the number one... Um, Answer to that question, 36%, okay, was, dim no, 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 having patience. 36%, you have to have patience. Okay, would everybody agree that you have to have patience to be, okay. See, no argument there, no argument. Um, to be an effective parent, you do have to have patience. The last one on the list again, 1%, having integrity or good character. It's like, wait a second, <laughs> something's wrong with this, okay? That's not right. Um, so, back to education. What is, what is good education? Any thoughts on that? When you ask a kid going to college, where do you want to go to school? They say, somewhere that I can get a good education. Why do you want to get a good education? So you can get a good job. What does good job mean? Money. Good job means money. Okay? In our culture, that's what you mean. Go to a good school so you can get a good education, a good degree, so that you can get a good job, and good means money, okay? If that's the case, what I tell people, nobody at CHA has a good job. We all have bad jobs, okay? That's not true, right? That's not true. But in our culture, it is. Uh, one of the books by um, J.P. Moreland, Love Lord Your God With All Your Mind, uh, he says this, <clears throat> Uh, another modern trend is to change in what we mean by the good life. From Old Testament times and ancient Greece until this century, the good life was widely understood to mean a life of intellectual and moral virtue. The good life is the life of ideal human functioning according to the nature that God himself gave to us. According to this view, prior to creation, God had in mind an ideal blueprint of human nature from which, from which he created every, each and every human being. Happiness was understood as a life of virtue, and the successful person was the one who knew how to live life well according to what we are by nature due to the created design of God. We live life as God created us to live it. That is a good life, all right? And I would say glorifying God is a good life. <clears throat> uh, understood in this way, happiness uh, involves suffering, endurance, and patience, because these are important means to becoming a good person who lives the good life. We don't like words like, see, it says happiness involves suffering. Nah, that doesn't sound right to us today. Happiness involves endurance. That nah, doesn't sound right to us. Happiness involves patience. But the, the reason that is true is because happy is the person who lives life as God designed him to live it. And we only live life as God designed us to live it by going through those things. James says, count it all joy, my brother, when we've done encounter trials, okay? Uh, according to the modern view, okay, the good life is the satisfaction of any pleasure or desire that someone freely and autonomously chooses for himself or herself. The successful person is the individual who has a life of pleasure and can obtain enough consumer goods to satisfy his or her desires, which is impossible, all right? Freedom is the right to do what I want. It's the right to do what... If you're free, you have the right to do what you want. Do you ever hear that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that's not the definition of freedom. Uh, rather than, uh, freedom is the right to do what I want. I uh, lost my place. <laughs> not the power to do what I, by nature, ought to do. Freedom is the power given by God to do what He wants me to do. If I can do what God wants me to do, I am free. 
Sin always binds, okay? Righteousness always frees, right? So those are the right definitions. So, so education, uh, your kids are getting educated at CHA. So that's what we're talking about, okay? So now, flip your sheet over, your notes, okay, on the back. I'm going to begin with the end because I want you to think about education, then we'll conclude, and then I'll start. <laughs> I know what I just said. I'll conclude, and then I'll start, okay? But I want to begin with the end in mind. So, what is the end? Uh, education, okay? Um, so, what is education? It's on your sheet. Educate, this is uh, Webster's 1828. For those of you who went to school here, you know what that is, right? That big green volume, okay? That Webster actually really didn't know what Webster wrote in 1828. If you haven't seen that, you need to read it. It's, it's remarkable. Um, anyway, education comprehends all that series of instruction and discipline, which is intended to... Okay, now, it's a whole series of instruction and discipline. <laughs> we don't like that word. Kids don't like that word. Which is intended to do four things, okay? Number one, to enlighten the understanding. Are there any things your children don't understand? They need to be educated. They, and it's like, ding, you see the little light bulb, you know? You know they, their understanding needs to be enlightened. It's one of the things that education does, Okay? Uh, number two, to correct the temper. Now, the temper is not, you know, their madness and they're angry and they have a bad temper. That's not really what that means. It means the, the control of the passions of life, the desires, the, the temper of their life, okay? And that's, that's on your sheet. So, to correct the temper, the, to control the passions of youth, all right? To form the manners and habits of youth. <laughs> Do your kids have any bad habits? It's like, uh, I have three boys. I have a lot of kids. Uh, my, my youngest three is what I meant. My last three are boys. They're, they're 14, 12, and 10. Uh, we've never had three boys together. We've had four girls together, but I have 10 kids. So anyway, so the last three are boys, and, and wow, they're wearing us out. Uh, we're old. <laughs> we're going we're wheel, to have wheelchairs for our kids' graduation. So um, They have some bad habits, and, and they, they don't just naturally have good manners, but that's what education is for, Okay. And then last, to fit for usefulness in future stations. God has something for them, and we are fitting them for usefulness. And I would, again, say that ultimately useful is uh, to glorify God in whatever that station in life is. So that's education, okay? Uh, so a question to ask yourself, who should be involved in the above four functions of education? If this is happening to your child, who do you want doing that? Who do you want enlightening their understanding. Conversation at our house recently has been regarding homosexuality. It's come up several times, actually. And, and today, the kids are taught. They need to understand that there are, are there six genders? Six or seven? I'm not kidding, okay? There's, okay, there's, there's hetero, homo, bi, trans, and there's, there's a whole bunch of genders now. And you might be any one of them. So if you have an affection toward a, you know, someone of the same gender, that's, you might be bisexual, you might be homosexual. You'll never know until you try it, okay? They are actively taught that. Who do you want enlightening your child's understanding? Not that person, okay? Um, who do you want correcting their temper, their passions? Well, I would suggest that those who are teaching your children from an unbiblical or humanistic worldview, that's not who we want, on the contrary, we want someone to teach your children from a biblical view, a biblical view of life and eternity, not just life, life and eternity, okay? And the scriptures are essential. We know 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that means mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Apart from the scripture, a child really can't be educated, Okay? Matter of fact, uh, uh, Proverbs, uh, Proverbs, in reference, get me. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Okay? And we have a lot of uh, highly educated fools. Highly educated, very intelligent. But if they don't believe in God, then they're a fool. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Okay? So that's not education. Now, well, that's kind of a part of what we've made education, okay? Get a good degree, so get a good job, make a lot of money. Okay, that's, that's not it, okay? And that's not what we're doing with your children. So, um, when I talk to families, I talk like this, okay? I had a family in my office Thursday from Norman. Actually, they live in Purcell. 
They said, we think we're going to enroll our kids next year. We're just going to keep driving per, per sale. Okay, okay, whatever. <laughs> it's very, very interesting. He works at OU, and they're homeschooling right now, so checking out schools to see. So I, this is the, I have this conversation with them. They said, well, tell me about CHA. What are you all doing? How do you do this? And so I just start, I just answer their questions. So here's what I want to talk to you about. Um, <clears throat> preference or conviction, educating your child in a Christian school. Now, to answer Chris's question, okay, he said, what are we doing here? My dad has done this presentation for, I really don't know, to tell you the truth. I know at least 15 years, maybe 20, 25. Okay, I don't know that. Um, and so when I became headmaster, uh, this, we just continued this because many, many, many parents, perhaps some parents of some in this room uh, who put some pressure on their parents at some point to have them leave CHA, um, it came down to a question, is, is having your child in a Christian school, is that a preference, something you prefer, which we'll talk about here in a second, or is it a conviction? So, and so because it, it may happen to you, okay, it hasn't happened to us because our kids just aren't, I started to say aren't, aren't stupid, um, but th they know they're not going to another school, okay? My kids have never put pressure on me and said, Dad, do we really have to go to CHA? It's like, <laughs> they're just not that dumb, okay? They're going to CHA, all right? But some of your kids may someday. They may go, you know, I have friends, and yeah. So when that pressure is applied, what will you do? And it's not as a fourth grader, probably. They're not going to do that to you, okay? Uh, and typically what happens is 10th and 11th grade, okay? 10th and 11th, all right? That's when kids generally leave CHA because they apply pressure on their parents and their parents give in, okay? And many of them, because they didn't have a really a conviction about it, they just, you know, it was a kind of a good deal. It's a preference. So that's what this is about, right? Okay, so what is the preference? It's a choice of one thing rather than another. Can you tell me something you prefer? Oh, yeah, sorry, we're back on the front page. Sorry, I told you I was starting. I'm starting now, okay? <laughs> I've already ended, now I'm starting. A preference is something you, that's a choice of one thing rather than another. Tell me something you prefer. Ex I, that is what I have written on my paper. I, have, I prefer chocolate rather than vanilla. That's what I have written down, okay? Exactly. So, um, there is no chocolate. Are you going to eat vanilla? Why not? Put a gun to your head. You can eat vanilla? Uh, I, I like vanilla, okay? Yeah. It's a preference, okay? What are some of the reasons that people have their children in private schools in general, Christian, private Christian schools in particular? What are some reasons? <coughs> Why do you have your kid here? No, I, I'm not, I, you know, I, I, it really should be for a lot of things, but what are some of the things you like about CHA as compared to where they were in school, unless you're a homeschooler? <laughs> uh, a public school. Want God in their education. Okay? Good. Anyone else? Okay, their peer pressure. Okay, the morality of those around them. Okay? Security, meaning what, Mr. Johnson? Okay? Just physical safety. Okay? Actually, there's a lot of kinds of security. Okay? There's emotional safety, social safety, spiritual safety. Okay? That's why I walk around this building most every day. I don't do it every day. Uh, but I generally, if I see some of you, I meet your children out there at the elementary, and then I have a path, literally, I have a path that I follow every day, and I go by every classroom in this building, okay, before I get to my office at about 8.45. Uh, and I pray for every teacher, that God will bless him or her, and I pray at every door. Lord, just keep that door closed. Keep, and they're all locked. We all know locks make very little difference. I didn't say no difference. The biggest locks that biggest difference that locks make, you think they're safe, okay? I mean, we have the, I have Chief Taylor, Chief Larry Taylor's the police chief of Dell City. He comes here. He's a friend of mine. Loves the Lord. Loves CHA. He just he just shakes his head. He said anybody can get in any door they want. He said, but it makes your parents feel better. I didn't say that. Dell City Police Chief said that. Okay, all right. I say because it came up. Uh, I said, "Well, what if there is a, an incident here, and you don't have a key? Do you need keys to our our building?" <laughs> the assistant police chief uh, was right there. Uh, John Smith, it's a funny name. John Smith was right there with him. He goes, he said, "We can get in when we need to get in." <laughs> he said, "Is that glass?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "We can get in." Yeah. Okay. But okay. Well, my point is, our our safety is not on the locks. Our safety is in the Lord. Okay. And and I believe the Lord does protect this place and has, okay? So we pray toward that end. So safety is one of those issues, okay? 
they're actually physically safer to public school. Phys- oh, well, as far as intruders, and maybe not from peers, okay, but from outsiders, public schools are safer than our building. Uh, Dell City just got their first day. SFSPO, uh, what do you call it? SPO. So I can't remember what the, that stands for. First armed officer in their buildings, okay? Uh, we don't have an armed officer in our building, and we have no plans to. <laughs> okay, we prefer that, though, okay? Well, what if that's not here? Well, what if some of those things go away? Probably some of them aren't going to go away, okay? If we ever t- quit teaching about the Lord in our classes, you should leave, okay? I wouldn't want my kid. I would leave. You'd have to follow me out the door, okay? A preference. We got the idea, okay? A conviction is a state of being convinced, a strongly held belief protected by your conscience. You, you can't give this one up. Okay? Just deny the Lord and you'll be fine. Can't do it. I'm going to shoot you. Shoot me. Can't do that. All right? I, that's my conviction. And we have some convictions, probably very few, rightly so. Okay? So is having your child in a Christian school a preference or is it a conviction? That's really what this is about. Okay, I'm going to pick up the speed here, so you have to follow me. Uh, what I'm going to share with you is taken from a book, uh, Dr. Glenn Schultz. Um, I won't tell you all about him. He's, um, I went to a conference this summer, Kingdom Schools Institute in Dallas at Prestonwood Christian Academy. Dr. Schultz is just an outstanding educator. <laughs> um, so that book, Kingdom Education, God's Plan for Educating Future Generations, uh, by Dr. Glenn Schultz. It was just a fascinating individual. Um, loves the Lord. He's the headmaster of uh, Sherwood Christian Academy in Georgia. You've heard of the movies uh, Fireproof. What are those other movies? Um, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Facing the Giants, is that right? Okay, those, those excellent movies, I believe, that we have all of those. Um, that he, that's Sherwood Baptist Church. Dr. Glenn Schultz is the headmaster of Sherwood Christian Academy. Okay, uh, an outstanding educator. So, so these thoughts are from Dr. Schultz's book that he wrote in 2002. So, here we go. Uh, nine things. Here's your blanks. We're going to go pretty quick. All right. The education of children. By the way, this is what we we stand on. These we believe these at CHA. By the way, we also believe that homeschooling is the best form of education. It's ideal. It's the best form of education because. They're directly under parents. We homeschooled all 10 of our children, okay, uh, to 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th grade, kind of depending on the child, okay, <laughs> when Janelle couldn't handle them anymore, and there were too many other kids in the house. So um, Janelle is a stay-at-home mom with no children at home now. She's a, she's a happy lady right now. Uh, <laughs> she homeschooled for 20 years, 20 years. So the education of children is the responsibility of the parents, Psalm 78 says, we will, we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he had done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. And there's several of the verses. I listed several more on your page. I'm not going to do all of them, okay? You can look at the others as you have time or desire to do so. That's just one, okay? The responsibility of parents to train children. Okay, well, we'll get there. Number two, the education of children is a 24-hour day, seven-day-a-week process that must take place from birth to maturity. And you know that. Okay, we all know when birth happens. We're not quite sure when maturity happens. And actually, it happens at different times for different children, but when, until they're mature, okay? Uh, okay, Deuteronomy 6, 7, we know this verse, one of the uh, most explicit verses on child rearing, child training. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, uh, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. We're always teaching our children. Now, that's easier said than done, okay? But the fact is, we are always teaching our children. Why? Because you're always doing what? You're always living, okay? And if you're living, you're teaching your kids. You say, well, I don't sit down and teach lessons all the time. I didn't say that. But when you're walking, when you're laying down, when you're watching TV, when you're working, when you're talking to your spouse, you're teaching your kids. All right? So you're always teaching your kids. And we can't think, well, no, I don't teach them very much. Yeah, you do. (laughs) 
okay? And it's, we understand that it's a 24-hour day, seven-day week process. Uh, so next one, number three. The education of children has as its primary goals the salvation and discipleship of the next generation. Um, again, it's just, there's so many things that God says about that. Psalm 78, that's a great chapter on uh, generational parenting, okay? That the generations to come might know them. Even the children which should be born. We're talking about kids that aren't born now, okay? Even to the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. It's talking about my kids who aren't born yet and their kids. It's generational parenting, okay? That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments, the, the education of children has as its primary goals the salvation and the discipleship of the next generation. Okay? Our mission statement, which I don't even think I put it on your paper tonight. I got the vision, but not the mission. Uh, the purpose of Christian Heritage Academy is to assist the home and church in building a solid foundation of life, a life characterized by, I can say that fast, okay? Uh, a personal salvation experience. It's number one on our list. A personal salvation experience. Development of Christian conscience. Development of Christian character. Development of Christian self-government. Four things we're shooting for, okay? Ultimate goal of the academy is to train up true Christian scholars who will be used of the Lord to propagate the gospel to the whole world and restore our American biblical, uh, Republic to its historic biblical foundations. Okay, I, I know I said that fast, but it's all over our literature. You can't miss our mission statement, okay? It's about salvation and then discipleship, okay? Next, number four, the education of children must be based on God's word as absolute truth. Let's see. I'm not watching my notes here, and I'm missing some things. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I normally read a couple things here. <clears throat> Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Okay? There's only a few things that are uh, eternal in nature. God himself, God's word will never pass away in the souls of men. Okay? Uh, the education of children must be based on God's word as absolute truth. That's one of the uh, places where uh, Martin Luther said this a long time ago, back in the 1500s. I'm afraid that schools will prove to be wide gates to hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the Holy Scriptures, engraving them in the hearts of youth. I advise no one to place his child where the Scriptures do not reign paramount. Every institution in which men are not constantly occupied with the Word of God must become corrupt. Okay? Wow. So they became great gates to hell. That's actually what he said. Right? Uh, this is a book, uh, King Me, What Every Son Wants and Needs from His Father by Steve Farrar. It's a great book. He says, uh, <clears throat> consider the school alternatives. That's titles. Consider the school alternatives. This one's short and sweet. That's what it says. This one is short and sweet. Not only does your son, this is just about sons, not only does your son need a good education, we all agree they need a good education, but he also needs healthy interaction with the male as a part of that education. On both counts, the public schools are woefully inadequate. Educationally, the public school system is deficient in biblical truth. I'm not slamming public schools. I was raised in a public school. Both of my parents taught in public schools, okay? But the fact is, public schools are deficient in biblical truth. That's not being hateful. That's being truthful, okay? And there's some problems with that if it's your child, okay? Uh, that's, that's, we believe that education must be based on God's Word as absolute truth, okay? Um, the education of children must hold Christ preeminent in all of life. Preeminent just means first place, Christ has to be first, okay? Uh, Colossians 1.18, and he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he, Christ, that in all things he might have the preeminence, in all things, and includes the education of our children, Christ has to be first and foremost, okay? Um, must be centered in Christ, I always want to comment too much. I'll keep going. Number six, the education of children, <laughs> this is a good one, must not hinder the spiritual and moral development of the, the next generation. So this is, this is a, it can't be negative. It needs to be positive. It can't be negative. It can't hinder their spiritual and moral development. Okay? Jesus had some pretty harsh things to say about this. Uh, Whoso shall offend one of these little ones? which believe in me were better for him than a millstone hanging around his neck. 
They were drowned in the depth of the sea. Jesus took children very seriously. One of the other references I have there is when the, you know, the disciples were trying to keep the children away from Jesus. Jesus said, hey, suffer not the little children. Come to me. Uh, Jesus loves little children. A little Sunday school song is true. Okay? Jesus loves children. Um, so, it, it can't hinder their spiritual and moral development. Okay? That's an important point. These are all important points. The education of children, if and when delegated to others by parents, must be done by teachers chosen with the utmost care to ensure that they all follow these principles. So who are you going to let teach your kid? Um, one of my favorite stories is the story of Hannah and Elkanah in First Samuel. Hannah didn't have children. She prayed to the Lord at the temple, uh, uh, at the tabernacle, uh, that God would uh, give her a child. And then Samuel was born, and they go back, and she said, I will dedicate this child to the Lord. As soon as uh, he was weaned, I don't know what age that is, but it doesn't say. I, uh, but it does say as soon as she had weaned her child, she took him to, Sam, to um, Eli, the priest, okay, and, uh, and she said to Eli, for this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. She handed over her son to the priest to be taught, okay? She was careful in how she, who she handed him over to to teach. Um, <clears throat> my pastor for 20 years, Tom Elliff, who was actually the pastor in this church, uh, before they moved out to their south location. Uh, Tom Elliff said uh, frequently, actually, uh, all four of Brother Tom's kids graduated from CHA. Uh, he said this, more important than what your children are learning is who your children are learning from. He said that all the time. More important than what your children are learning is who they're learning from. Okay? Um, actually, the next point, but uh, it's, they, these two go together, Okay? Number eight, the education of children results in the formation of lifestyles or worldviews that will be patterned after the belief system and worldviews of their teachers. This one goes along with the previous one. So what is the lifestyle and worldview of the people who are teaching your children? Whatever it is, your kids are going to pick it up, or at least a portion of it, maybe a significant portion of it. Another reason that homeschooling is best, because who's their, whose worldview are they going to pick up? Yours, okay? Uh... So uh, Luke 6, 40 is a verse we say all the time around here, okay? Uh, a student is not above his teacher, but everyone who, when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. Jesus said everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. So you want to see what your kids are going to look like? Look at their teachers, okay? Uh, it's really critical, right? Um, and I told you what Brother Tom said. Um, Josh McDowell, he said uh, that there are many of our students from Christian families, uh, actively involved in local churches, which they should be, who have, and I quote Josh McDowell, he said, they have saved little Christian hearts and pagan little minds. They really are saved. Okay? They've come to know the Lord as their personal Savior. Um, but they, their worldview and their lifestyle is just pagan because that's what they've been taught and who they've been taught by. So that's an important, important point, okay? Uh, last one. You're doing good. Actually, my favorite, okay? The education of children must have a view of the future that includes the eternal perspective. Life is not over when this life is over. And if their education doesn't teach them that, then it's deficient, okay? I, I didn't, um, I don't have any verses up here on the screen for this one. I, there was, I don't think I do. No, I didn't. Um, I, and I couldn't pick one. I have to say all three. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ setteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Okay, be careful. This world is not all there is. Okay? This is just a blip on the radar screen of eternity. All right? So it, our education has to say, wait a second. This life is just a preparation for the life to come. All right? Colossians 3, Matthew 6, 19, 20, lay not up for yourselves treasures in heaven, treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, nor thieves do not break through and steal. And then verse 21 says, for where your treasure is, there will your 
heart be also. Okay? Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Um, 1 Corinthians 3, uh, Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, um, talking about uh, the, um, the, the judgment seat of Christ. And so here he says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I, Paul, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation no man can lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Meaning, there is, no other, there is no salvation in any other. And this is talking to believers, not lost people, okay? The foundation must be Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation of his salvation, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day, it's the day of judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, not the white throne judgment, for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved. We're not talking about lost people here. Okay? Yet so as by fire. So there are people who will, are saved. They are going to heaven. Their sins are forgiven. But they have spent their life not glorifying God with a pagan worldview and they're going to heaven, yes, Josh Dow, save little Christian hearts. But at the judgment seat of Christ, they're literally going to watch the works of their life just burn up as wood, hay, and stubble. Okay? And they will get to heaven. They will be saved, yet so is by fire. The picture is there as a person running out of a burning house. What do they have on? I would just, they're clothes on their back. Okay? Uh, there will be some people, Paul says, both here and in Romans, that, that will have a, an abundance of rewards, which we will then, yes, cast at the feet of Christ because he does. Obey. Uh, so anyway, the, the, the point is that there's more to this life than this life, and our education has to teach kids that, okay? It's not all about the stuff we can accumulate here in life and then leave it behind. We all know that, okay? Um, so we're almost done. So what we're doing, and, and God's given us the grace to really be improving in it. I mean, I, the teachers here are just fantastic, okay? Um, I, you know, I'm just a background person, right? The administration's job is to remove distractions and provide resources for the teachers because the teachers are the ones who are influencing the kids. And this is what teachers are doing, okay? Uh, Luke 640 doesn't say everyone who was fully trained will be like his headmaster. <laughs> it doesn't say that. It says they'd be like his teacher, okay? The teachers are the key. Um, the rest of us are important. They can't, have, they can't teach if we don't do our job, but it's the teachers that impact the kids' lives. So the teachers, our vision here is to train American Christian leaders for every sphere of society. This is our heart. This is what we're doing, okay? So to explain, a leader is one who influences others. If you've come in our front door, you see this on the bronze plaques out there, okay? This, it's, it's embedded in us. A leader is one who influences others. We want to turn out kids who are people of influence, okay? Not just leaders, though, a Christian leader, one who influences others for Christ. There are some bad leaders. Was, was Hitler influential? <laughs> yeah, very persuasive. Millions followed him to death, okay? He was not a Christian leader, all right? He was a leader. He was not a Christian leader. We want a Christian leader, one who influences others for Christ, of and pertaining to Christ. And then not just a Christian leader, but here, one of our distinctives here, there are other good Christian schools in the city. I, I, I'm having lunch in a couple weeks with Al King at OCS. I talked to um, um, Paul McDonald at Crossings Christian School um, a couple of weeks ago. I, I went to OCS a couple weeks ago and uh, talked with Al King and I'm going to go back up there in a couple weeks. Um, Barbara Osfeld at Community Christian uh, they do a good job at Community Christian. Uh, Mrs. Osfeld's son graduated from CHA, okay? We have two of our graduates that are teachers there. Southwest Covenant in Yukon, their high school principal is one of our graduates, okay? They do a great job at Southwest Covenant, okay? They're, they're, and that's just the bigger schools, okay? There's the Academy, the Veritas Providential, Providence Hall, Nathan Carr, another one of our graduates is the uh, principal of that school uh, working uh, there. So... <laughs> We don't have any, those are sister schools, not competitor schools, okay? However, 
None of them with except perhaps the Southwest Covenant, okay, because Kevin Cobbs is there, <laughs> okay. Uh, they take their seniors on their same senior trip that we take because Kevin was a senior and he'd take the same trip with his high school kids, okay. So Southwest Covenant is doing some of the things, same things we do, okay, which we're thankful for. But here really is one of our distinctives. We, we are training American Christian leaders, okay, not in an elite sense, okay, not as a I don't know, a nationalistic sense, but as a historical sense. We, we believe that God founded this country with a gospel purpose to share the gospel around the world, and that has happened. God has accomplished His purpose in our nation. We're dwindling. It's going downhill now, but we're still the greatest missionary sending nation in the world. Okay? Go on a mission trip and ask them where they get their money. Where does the money come from to do that? Where did the money come from for that project? Where does the money come from that? And what do they say? Christians in America, okay? We're still funding the, spirit, the sharing of the gospel. We have economic liberty. We have civil liberty. We have political liberty. And we are, we believe, to use our liberties, which we are rapidly losing, to do what God gave us as a nation to do, and that is to share the gospel, okay? So we want to train American Christian leaders. Uh, that's a Christian leader who is pursuing our national gospel purpose. That's no better than any other nation's gospel purpose. It just happens to be the one God gave us. If I was in Korea, I would be training Korean Christian leaders. And there are a lot of them. That's growing, okay? If I were in, you name the nation, I would be training, you know, French Christian leaders. I don't know if there's any of those, okay? <laughs> yeah. We're Americans, all right? God put us here. We're training American Christian leaders, all right? Doing what God gave us to do. So that's what we're doing. And it's not just that, but it's in every sphere of society. We're actually growing in our understanding of this. It used to be we kind of had this weird idea that, that that's just, I don't even like the term, full-time Christian workers or full-time Christian ministry, okay? Name me a ministry that's not full-time Christian. So that's a bad thinking, okay? I know what we mean, okay? I'm one of those too, but, I, but still, we're, we're, we're saying, yeah, but, wait, but in every sphere of society, we're training American Christian leaders to go out, to in the home, number one, moms and dads, husbands, wives, in the church, we need Christian leaders in the church, we need them in businesses, which we have many of those around our city. We have CHE grads in all over the place, okay, we're very thankful for that. Education, I just named several of our graduates who are in positions of leadership and teaching, and Destiny has two of our graduates teaching at their Christian school right down the street. They're all over the place, okay? The Lord's blessing us in that regard. In government, uh, we just had our first CHA graduate elected to the state uh, House of Representatives, John Eccles, okay? John's great, okay? Uh, so that's growing as well. Media, I sat at the football game at, in Tulsa at Lincoln Christian Academy with Kelly Hines and uh, Chance Stevens, graduated in 88 and, no, 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 that's not two, 2001 and 2003, Chance and Kelly, just friends that live in Tulsa. Chance is the uh, head basketball coach, head girls basketball coach at Tulsa Memorial High School. He thinks they have a chance to win state this year. Uh, he's in education and business. He's a salesman from Mohawk Flooring Industries that, that all this came from Mohawk. Chance got all this for us. Um, and then media, Kelly Hines is the lead sports writer for the Tulsa World. She covers all the OSU football and basketball games. And, and Kelly just has a great ministry there at the Tulsa World. So we have graduates in every sphere. Uh, last one, arts and entertainment. Uh, we have Olivia Yacht, who uh, started her own dance studio uh, in, on I-40 out of Anderson Road. Uh, just training little girls in dance and loves the Lord and is mentoring those young ladies. Uh, in the arts, okay, we have several others. Okay? This, this is our vision to train American Christian leaders for every sphere of society. So, preference or conviction? Educating your child in a Christian school. I hope I've given you some things to... <laughs> the thought just flashed through my head that, man, you're good. <laughs> Arrogant. It's 7.59. I'm supposed to start, I'm supposed to stop at 8, okay? That, that was a coincidence. I'm, I'm not arrogant, by the way, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, we wanted to stop at 8 o'clock and we made it. Uh, is it a preference or a conviction? What has God given you to do with your children? Uh, so I hope that if those pressure years come in the years ahead, you say, wait, 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 wait. I use this line on my kids. I say, wait, do you want me to do what you want me to do or do you want me to do what God has told me to do? I just let my kids choose. Do you want your dad to disobey God? Well, no. I, look, 
here's what God's told me and your mother to do. This is what we're going to do, okay? You don't want me to do anything other than that, do you? No, I don't want a dad who doesn't obey the Lord. Okay, then we got to do this. We'll help you, but, you know, this is what we're doing, okay? Right? Yeah, I've used that line a lot, okay? Um, so, but that's my conviction, okay? This is what God's given me to do. And uh, kids really appreciate that, by the way. They will push until they know that you're strong enough to stand it. And they want to know that you can stand it. Don't give in, okay? And not just this, but uh, they're testing you. And as soon as you show yourself worthy and up to the test, they can relax because they're good because mom and dad are taking care of them, all right? That's a parenting seminar, though. <laughs> uh, I'm doing that on October the 10th in our in-service day with all of our faculty. You're invited to that. You'll get an email tomorrow about that. If you, uh, It'll be all day on that Thursday, so anyway. So uh, we have a lot to learn about parenting. What, is, what does God say about parenting? So preview that. Sorry about that. Let's pray together. It's probably 8.01 now. I'm late. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for this evening. Thank you for these parents, for their children. Thank you for giving us the privilege uh, here at CHA to have them here at school, to be partnering with them to train their children to know you, to love you, to serve you, to be used of you, to bring glory to yourself and uh, be a blessing to and share the gospel with others. Lord, we thank you for giving us that privilege. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for this uh, school, for this facility you've given us to be able to use. Lord, we pray that you continue to have your hand of protection and provision on this school, our families, and our children. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. I must have turned the air conditioner off in here. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So